morning, happy Sabbath. Buenos dias, feliz sábado. We have a, a little bit of summarization that we need to do. If you picked up the syllabus, um, we're starting on page 158, sermon number 12. During this week, we've already set forth 11 sermons. And uh, one of those sermons was a condensation of six sermons that we did in a previous meeting in Boise, Idaho. So in reality, we're about 17 hours into a, a presentation, and you're, you're getting here right at the punchline, and there's a lot of pieces that some of you that are here this morning for the first time might not be familiar with. So I'm going to try to very quickly summarize where we've been to make some logic about where we're going to go today. Hopefully, okay. Got it. Uh, the premise of this study that we've been doing here this week has to do with this chart. This chart is the 1843 chart that was, according to Sister White, in early writings, page 74, was directed by the hand of the Lord. And she says that none of the figures should be altered. She says there were some things that were not understood on this chart, that the Lord had held his hand over this chart until he removed his hand. Uh, in connection with this 1843 chart, you have statements that we already have in the presentations on the record, where Sister White says, we are to continue to present the message that, let me back up, the sentence before says, we have no new message. We are to continue to present the things that brought the people out of the churches in 1843 and 44. And what brought the people out of the churches in 1843 were the presentations by the Millerites based upon these charts. Every Millerite preacher used this chart. This is the message of the Millerites, and inspiration says we have new, no new message, yet here we are at the end of the world, and by and large, most Seventh-day Adventists are fully unfamiliar with, with this chart. As an example, not, not to be speaking down, but to try to bring us up to speed, how many of us in this room are prepared to give a Bible study today to a non-Adventist on the 2520 time prophecy? How many can do that? Will you raise your hand? Look around how many hands we got up. Just a few. See, Sister White says, we have no new message that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. And one of the time prophecies the Millerites were proclaiming was the 2520. And here at the end of the world, we don't know what that is. But we're to continue to present that message. That's just to try to introduce you to one of the premises of this presentation. Another important aspect of this presentation is the history. Over here on, on this, this um, board, we have listed when the first, second, and third angel's message came into history. We're waiting for the fourth. Inspiration is very clear that the first angel's message was empowered on August 11th, 1840. I have 1840 up here just to not get it so cluttered. But on August 11th, 1840, a fulfillment of a revelation from chapter 9, verse 15, uh, had been predicted by the Millerites, and uh, the world did not think it was going to come to pass. They were telling the world, the Millerites, that on August 11th, 1840, the Ottoman Empire would collapse. And when it did, it confirmed before the world that the year-day principle that the Millerites was using was accurate, and it added a power to the Millerite movement. This is the first angel's message being empowered. Sister White's clear about that. This is also when the angel in Revelation 10 comes down out of heaven um, with the little book of Daniel open in his hand with one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the earth. And Sister White says that's identifying that that the message of this time would be carried to the world. And sure enough, the Adventist historians tell us that in 1840, the Millerites had already prepared their literature and their tracts. They were already in the boats in the West Coast and the East Coast of the United States. And when this event took place, the message of the Millerites went around the world. Every mission station in the world was confronted with the Millerite message. In June of 1842, in Portland, Maine, the organized churches began to close their door on William Miller, and the second angels of message had arrived in history. The Millerites didn't understand it at that point in time, but technically that's when the denominations closed the door of their probation against the Millerite movement. In October 22nd, 1844, the third angels message arrived in history. Um, once again, the Millerites, or the, the, 
The little flock at that time did not understand that was the third angel's message, but the third angel's message is a warning against receiving the mark of the beast, which is Sunday keeping. And on October 22nd, 1844, the doors open to the most holy place where you can see the Ten Commandments and understand the Sabbath. So I'm talking about where these messages arrive in history, not so much as when God's people begin to understand and proclaim them. Why is this important? It's important because there is not simply a few, but there are several places in inspiration that teach very specifically that this history from 1840 to 1844 will be fulfilled again to the very letter. Sister White's clear that from 1840 to 44, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled. And in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, she says this parable has been and will be fulfilled again to the very letter, for it has special application to this time. This history here is repeated again to the very letter. Sister White, when commenting on the seven thunders in Revelation 10, verse 4, she says those seven thunders represent the events that transpired in the first and second angel's message. In other words, the seven thunders in Revelation 10, ver verse 4, represents the history of 1840 to 44. And then in the same passage, Sister White says that these, the seven thunders also represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. So here's another place where inspiration is saying this history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. And there are other places to show that. And uh, when I mentioned that these meetings here, we were preceded by some meetings in Idaho. In the Boise meetings in Idaho, we took six hours just pointing out from inspiration different places where inspiration teaches that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. Daniel 12. Daniel 12, there's an increase of knowledge. When a book is unsealed in Daniel 12, that's the Millerites. Unsealing the, God is unsealing the book of Daniel to the Millerites, and from that increase of knowledge, they go out and proclaim this message. But there's going to be an increase of knowledge at the end of time. Sister White is, is clear about that. Daniel 12 is teaching a repeat of the Millerite history. The parable of the ten virgins is teaching a, a repeat of the Millerite history. The seven thunders is teaching a repeat of the Millerite history. Bible teaches upon the testimony of two or three things established. There are other testimonies, but I'm just trying to bring you up to speed to where we're at today. So, um, if you look closely, this is Adventism, brothers and sisters. This is Adventism. And if you, if you stand back and look at this just from a prophetic point of view, you have the three angels' messages that came into history in the Millerite time period, and now we're waiting for the fourth angels' message, right? The fourth angels' message of Revelation 18. Over and over again in Bible prophecy, in, a passage, in passages that are dealing with the end of the world, you see this very combination of a three-one combination. The three messages followed by the fourth somewhere in the future. That combination is emphasizing the history of, of us, the Millerite time period and us. Brothers and sisters, we are the people that are called to be the 144,000. We are the people that are living now in the fulfillment of this history. This history is repeating. You can show this from prophecy that the Millerite history is repeating now as we speak. We've been waiting for 150 years for the arrival of the fourth angel's message. We're, we're at this time period, and as you go back into history, biblical history, you see this 3-1 combination repeated over and over again, and it's, it's emphasizing Adventism from the beginning to the end. For example, there are 11 places where Sister White says that Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's image on the plain of Dura, the test in Daniel chapter 3, that that's the Sunday law. Have you ever asked yourself why uh, Daniel wasn't in that story? It was just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they came to the testing image, and then what happened to them? They're thro thrown in the flaming fire, and a fourth appears. Jesus says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the end of the world be. And Noah and his three sons got on the ark. Jesus said, as the days of Lot were, and Abraham in that story was visited by how many heavenly visitors? Three. Three, one combination is identifying a history that has a relationship to us, Adventism. That the three angels' message came into Adventism at the beginning. Um, now, the heart of Adventism is what? The 2300-day prophecy. In the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8:14, I didn't know that was your affirmation verse, so I could have selected another one for the scripture reading. 
But this is the third angel's message that came into history on October 22nd, 1844. It's the third message. It's preceded by the first and second message, and now we're waiting for the fourth message. This is the 2300-day prophecy, correct? Where does the 2300-day prophecy begin? Does it begin on the first decree or the fourth decree or the second decree? It begins on the third decree, and it ends on the third message. Now, the three decrees that begin this time prophecy, they're bringing Israel out of Babylon to do what? To rebuild and restore Jerusalem, correct? And uh, once they came out of Babylon... Once they came out of Babylon, they began the work of rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem. Sister White, several places, says the work that they carried out in literally rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem represents the work that Adventism does in restoring spiritual Jerusalem at the end of the world. And when they took up this work, what happened? They went into a backslidden condition, correct? They started doing, building their own homes. They didn't finish the work. And the Lord had to raise up someone to finish the work. Who is it that was raised up? Nehemiah, and before Nehemiah returned to finish the work, what did he do? He secured a fourth decree. In the very beginning of the 2300-day prophecy, you have a 3-1 combination. Three decrees followed by a fourth decree, and the 2300-day prophecy ends on the third message, and we're waiting for the fourth message, the fourth angel's message. And the fourth angel's message has been prefigured by the work of Nehemiah, who brought a revival and reformation. And if you look at Early Writings, page 259, please mark this down so you can check it out when you go home. In the days of Christ, there were three tests. The first test was John the Baptist. The second test was when the organized church decided that it was expedient that one would die in order that the whole nation would be saved. That was the second test in the time period of Christ. It was followed by... In between here and the third test, which was the cross, you have the triumphal entry, and Sister White compares the midnight cry of the Millerite time period by going to the history of the triumphal entry. It's the same history. And after these three tests, which Sister White points to in early writings, page 259, she, she has a paragraph where she deals with this history, and then the next paragraph she deals with the history of the three angels' messages in, in the Millerite time period. She compares this directly. But after the cross, what is the next point in that history that we should take note of? It's called Pentecost. And Pentecost certainly prefigures the latter reign, correct? And Pentecost prefigures Nehemiah. So all I want you to see, and I, brothers and sisters, there are so many places where the 3-1 combinations in Scripture, it's amazing. And it's, it's telling us that it's a prefiguring the history of Adventism. What's, this, what's the passage in the Bible that uh, teaches us the truth that Sister White says this way? Sister White has a statement you're probably all familiar with, speaking about the Sunday Law. She says, the Sunday Law time period, every earthly support will be cut off. You know that? Are you familiar with that quote? Okay, where's the passage in the Bible where that experience of every earthly support being cut off, where's that at? No? That's, 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 anyone remember the story of Job? Now, in the story of Job, was he visited by two friends or four friends? Three friends. Okay, over and over again. There's an illustration of the second coming of Christ in the time of, of Christ himself when he went to the Mount of Transfiguration. And when he was transfigured, there he is with... Uh, uh, Moses and Elijah representing the, the saved at the end of the world, some that don't die and some that are laid to rest. But when Jesus went upon the Mount of Transfiguration, how many disciples did he take with him? Three, one. It just, I don't have the time to, to lay all these out for you, but I want you to see that when you see a three-one combination, you are seeing God's signature upon that particular history saying this is a history that prefigures the history of Adventism. Adventism. So, that being said, this history of the Millerite time period is repeated at the end of the world. We need to understand that history if we're going to understand what's going to confront us at the end of the world. And in our series, what we've been developing is that this chart was one of the components of the Millerite history.
history. And therefore, we're making the argument that as this history is repeated at the end of the world, this chart, once again, will have a present truth component connected to it. So we've been taking different sections of this chart. We've been looking at the daily. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not going to discuss what the daily in the book of Daniel here represents today. There's, but I just want you to just consider this. Maybe you, I know there's some people that were just baptized here recently. I don't expect you to have an understanding of what the daily, the word daily in the book of Daniel represents. And I know we're at different levels here, but here's what I want you to understand. In the pioneer time period, they understood the daily in the book of Daniel to represent paganism, a satanic power. But here at the end of the world in Adventism, we teach the daily in the book of Daniel represents Christ's high priestly ministry, a godly power. Now, it's not a close disagreement. Is the daily a satanic power or is the daily a godly power. That's the argument. Is it Christ's work in the sanctuary or is it paganism? Of course, Sister White in early writings, page 74, when she says this chart is directed by the hand of the Lord, she said the pioneers were correct in their understanding. So as you go through this chart and you start taking the different components of this chart and suggesting that this chart has a relevance at the end of the world, you see that it's not just easy information. There's some things there you have to take some time to look at. The daily is one of them. Another of them, one of them that we have been dealing with is that here, William Miller, based on Leviticus 26, in, in chapter 26 of Leviticus, which is a chapter where the blessings and cursings against Israel in connection with the covenant are set forth by Moses. If they keep the covenant, they will be blessed. But after Moses lays out the possible blessings, he says, but if you break the covenant, then the cursings come. And brothers and sisters, the Seventh-day Adventists, we always point to Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel's prayer where he's identifying himself with the sins of his people in Daniel 9. And sometimes we forget that there's two places in there where Daniel says, by the way, I understand the reason that we are in this condition here in Daniel chapter 9 is because of the curse of Moses. Daniel was directly pointing to this pronouncement of blessing of curses by Moses. So that's part of the story of Daniel. And in Leviticus 26, according to William Miller, there are four verses that say if Israel would break the covenant, that they would be punished but with seven times. And what's a time in Bible prophecy? It's a year. And what's a year in Bible prophecy? 360 days. So you see it up there on the chart, but I'll put it here as well. And Leviticus 26 says that there would be 2,520 years of punishment brought against Israel for breaking the covenant. And William Miller says the punishment began in the year 677 when the southern kingdom was carried into captivity. And you have Bible references for this, but if you start 677 B.C. and add 2,520 years to it, you do not come to 1843. You don't do that. This is one of the mistakes on this chart. Because when it came to this history, William Miller forgot to factor in the year zero. He did it on the 2520. He did it on the 2300. If you start at 677 and you add 2,520 years, you come to 1844. That's the 2,520 year prophecy. But there was a man named Hiram Edson. How many know who Hiram Edson is? Hiram Edson is the, the man that on October 23rd, 1844, after the great disappointment, he's walking through the cornfield and suddenly he has some type of vision where he realized that what took place on October 22nd is that Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place. Seems to me that the Holy Spirit had enough confidence in this brother that he could trust him with that light. So I'm just saying this it seems like he has a little bit of heavenly endorsement on who and what he is. And James and Ellen White thought very highly of him because they named one of their sons after him. Edson White is named after Hiram Edson. And in 1850, James White, the editor of the Review and Herald, he contacted Hiram Edson and said, can you contribute some articles for this, this magazine called the Review and Herald that we're starting? We need some articles coming in so we can keep feeding the flock of God. And Hiram Edson put together a series of articles where he went back in and he explained why William Miller was wrong. He says, 
Israel was divided into two kingdoms, were they not? There was a northern kingdom, the ten tribes, and a southern kingdom. Everyone familiar with that? Israel divided into two kingdoms, and, and the, the second one to go into captivity was the southern kingdom. That's what William Miller pointed to, and Hiram Edson said no. What William Miller should have done is he should have started when the kingdom was first carried into captivity, and that was in the year 723 B.C. Not, that's not a tube. 723 B.C. And therefore... If you start in 723 B.C. and you do seven times, 2,520 years, you know where you come to? You come to 1798. And what that means, the pioneers believed that the book of Daniel emphasized two desolating powers. The first desolating power was paganism. The second was papalism. And these desolating powers, according to Scripture, were to trample down God's people for a specific time because they broke the covenant. And when you see what Hiram Edson's saying, he's saying that if you start in 723 and you do 2,520 years and come to 1798, the absolute middle point of that is the year 538. Eight, and suddenly you see 1,260 years of paganism trampling down God's people, followed by 1,260 years of papalism trampling down God's people. And brothers and sisters, that can't be an accident. That's not a coincidence. So Hiram Edson makes a case, and in your notes, if you took some of them, you'll see his complete series of articles. He makes the case that Brother Miller was wrong. And you know what? Brother Miller and Brother Edson were wrong. And Brother Edson and Brother Miller were right. Because it was two kingdoms that received the identical punishment. And the one line of prophecy, the northern kingdom, it's emphasizing the trampling down that takes place because God's people broke the covenant. And in doing so, it breaks the time period perfectly in half and say half the trampling down is done by paganism and half by papalism. But the second trampling down of the, the southern kingdom begins in 677, and it ends in 1844, and it is not emphasizing the trampling down. You know what it's emphasizing? It's emphasizing the fact that the covenant is broken here and the covenant is reestablished here. This line of prophecy is emphasizing the scattering. This line of prophecy is emphasizing the gathering. Okay, and the scattering the gathering? Read early writings, page 74. Early writings, page 74, is where Sister White says this chart with the 2520 was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. And as she makes her endorsement for this chart, in one paragraph, the first two-thirds of the paragraph, you know what she's speaking about? The scattering and the gathering. In fact, the title of that chapter is The Gathering Time. So you can't separate these truths from this chart, and you can't deny that inspiration has endorsed them, even though we no longer know what they are. So what happens? We're just doing, we're trying to catch you up from... 11 presentations, so bear with us. We haven't even started the sermon. If 1798, 1798 from 1844 is what? 46 years. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 2. Brothers and sisters, we're going to look at the truth that the, the Jews used to crucify Christ. They, they tried many things, but the, the argument they arrived on was that the fact that Jesus said he was going to raise up the temple in three days. And uh, if you start in verse... Um, let me see... It's good to start in verse 13 because in verse 13, John 2, verse 13, it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money setting. And it describes the first time that Jesus cleansed the temple. Now, brothers and sisters, the reason it's good to start there 
is Sister White is very plain that in this time period of the Millerite time period and the second angel's message, she compares the second angel's message in the midnight cry five different places. She compares it to the first time that Jesus cleansed the temple. So when, when we're looking at the temple cleansing in the days of Christ, Sister White has said, this is Millerite history. When it comes to the fourth angel's message down here, she compares it to the second time Christ cleansed the temple. In fact, the second angel's message and the fourth angel's message are both a call out of Babylon. And all by themselves, they teach us that the history associated with the second angel's message is prefiguring the history associated with the fourth angel's message. So anyway, when you're in John chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the temple. And in verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto them, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. This is the statement that Jesus makes that the Jews use ultimately to have him crucified. So this is an important piece of information, but notice the next verse. Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in the building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? Brothers and sisters, it's not an accident that from 1798 to 1844, it's 46 years. Hiram Edson calls the 1798 the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. I would suggest to you that you can show from Scripture, and that's what we're going to do in, the, in this presentation if we get there in the following one. The time of the Gentiles was fulfilled in 1844, and that's correct, and so is Hiram Edson correct. It's in this time period that God was gathering his people together once again to reinstate a covenant with Israel, modern Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist church, God's denominated people. He was stretching forth his hand again to gather unto himself a people that would reflect his character to a dying world. And the idea that there's 46 years between 1798 and 1844 cannot be separated from these two time prophecies of 2520 because they all are dealing with the reestablishment of God's temple only here at the end of the world. It's the spiritual temple, not the literal temple. And, and we could go through and show you the 46 years here in the three days and the 46 years here in the three days and the 46 years here in the three days, but we don't have time to go into that. We need to start into our, our subject. And our subject today is sermon number 12. It's called God's Denominated People. If you have the syllabus, uh, you can read along. Uh, but if you're not, we're going to look at Revelation 10, verse 11, and on into 11, verse 1. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. This is John. John in chapter 10 of Revelation has taken the book of Daniel. And he eats it and it's, he's, it's sweet in his mouth, but it becomes bitter in his stomach. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know this is the experience of the Millerites, including their disappointment. <coughs> And as soon as you get to verse 11, which we just read, it says, this all ha happens again. You must prophesy again. See, even here in chapter 10, it's teaching us that the Millerite time period is repeated. Because chapter 10 of Revelation is, is the Millerite time period. It begins when the mighty angel comes down in verse 1 in 1840, and it ends there with the bitter disappointment of the book of Daniel, bitter in John's stomach. And then the next verse says, you must do this again. The Millerite time period repeats. And then he is told to go measure the temple of God. And you'll see in your quotes there, a quote from Sermons and Talks, volume 2, page 53. The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshipers thereof. Remember, when you are walking on the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When John is told immediately after the disappointment to go measure the temple of God, one of the things that he is to understand or that we are to understand is that we've reached the point where judgment has begun. October 22nd, 1844, the judgment began. Now notice verses 2 and 3. This uh, is verses that is not widely, if at all, understood in Adventism. And I'm forewarning you, 
I mean, when you hear someone sharing something new, you have a responsibility to test it with God's word. And if it's correct, accept it. If it's incorrect, reject it. Verse 2 and 3 says this. After he's told to measure the temple, it says, But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given to the Gentiles. Where is this court given? Who is it given to? It's given to the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. In, in the sanctuary, that's verses 2 and 3 of, of Revelation 11. Okay? And now I'm going to read Spirit of Prophecy. And do we have any more syllabuses? Do, who would like a syllabus? Raise your hand. We'll send them out as far as they go. And we're on page 158. Um, but on 158, from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 149, it says this. Keep your hands up while they get them out to you. In the temple at Jerusalem, there was a partition wall separating the outer court from the inner one. Gentiles were permitted to enter the outer court, but it was only lawful for Jews to penetrate into the inter inner closure. Did we run out? There's one more. That's uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 149. Oh, 158. 158. Sorry. Sorry. You don't have one. Um, anyway, I, I, let me make a, read a couple statements, and I'll try to tell you how I'm understanding this relationship of inner court, outer court. Um, one, page 158. It says, tr in, in Ministry of Healing, page 20, it says, Christ taught often in the outer court of the temple that the Gentiles might hear his words. In the temple, the outer court is where the Gentiles were allowed. The inner court, only the Jews. There was a... There was a distinction that the Gentiles were not allowed in the inner court. Of course, the Bible talks about this. This is the partition wall that Christ broke down at the cross, but don't, don't just leave it there. We have more to say. Signs of the Times, December 10th, 1894. The time was approaching when he should leave his followers, but he promised them that the Spirit should come to lead them into all truth, to illuminate to their minds the scriptures which he had, he had himself given to patriarchs and prophets. No longer were the Gentiles to be kept in heathenism. What's a Gentile? It's someone in heathenism or, as it were, in the outer courts of the temple. To be in the outer courts of the temple was to be a Gentile. It was to be in heathenism. It was to be separate from the people of God. And when John is told in, in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2 and 3, go measure the court, but leave out the outer court, one of the things that's happening there is there's a distinction being made for once again between God's people and the Gentile world because on October 22nd, 1844, for only the second time in sacred history, God married a people unto himself, entered into a covenant with a people, gave those people his name, gave them his law, and they became modern Israel, and they were to be distinct from all the rest of human beings in the world. And that's what John is representing here with the distinction, measure not the outer court, measure the worshipers within the temple. 1844, God raised up modern Israel. It's important for us to understand because, brothers and sisters, we are modern Israel. We need to know who and what we are. Page 159, Patriarchs and Prophets. The opinion is held by many that God placed a separating wall between the Hebrews and the outside world, that his care and love, withdrawn to a great extent from the rest of mankind, were centered upon Israel. But God did not design that his people should build up a wall of partition between themselves and their fellow man. Brothers and sisters, did God design the sanctuary? Yes. Was there a distinction between the inner court and the outer court? Yes. But was that distinction in the design of the sanctuary supposed to teach Israel that they had no responsibility to carry the gospel to the rest of the world? No, they, it's Israel that, that put the wrong understanding upon the partition wall. It was never God's intent that that was to happen. So when the Bible's speaking about Jesus breaking down the partition wall that separated Israel and the Gentile world, he's talking about breaking down the traditions and customs that had blinded the Jews. He's not necessarily tearing down the design of the sanctuary. 
Next quote, Desire of Ages, page 400. The partition wall which the Jewish pride had erected shut even the disciples from sympathy with the heathen world, but these barriers were to be broken down. The Jews had erected a partition wall between themselves and every other people, but this was not after the direction of the Lord. That signs of the times, October 9th, 1896. Um, there's another quote. I'm going to move past that. What I'm suggesting here, we're now in Ephesians on the page 159, is that on October 22nd, 1844, where John, the book that John had eaten with, that was sweet has become bitter, at that point, he's told to go measure the temple, and one of the distinctions in that passage is John is told, but leave out the outer court, emphasizing that on October 22nd, 1844, God had separated a special people unto himself, his denominated people, his modern Israel the people that were to be the keepers of the law, the people that were going to enter into a covenant with him. And brothers and sisters, these two time prophecies of the 2520, they are time prophecies that lead you to the place where the temple is going to be erected again. They can't separate him from this truth. That's why we included that in the lead-in. So look at Ephesians 2, verse 11 through 22. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. When you come to Christ, you are no longer... Gentiles, and in the second paragraph there, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant promises. When we come out of the Gentile world, we became inheritors of the covenant promises. I'm going to move past that because of time. Go to page 160. And we'll start where it says an important error. Era. Not an important error. Important era. The Christian church was at this time entering upon an important error. Era. The work of proclaiming the gospel message was now to be prosecuted with vigor among the Gentiles, and the church's result was to be strengthened by a great ingathering of souls. The apostles who had been appointed to lead out in this special work would be exposed to suspicion, prejudice, and jealousy. Their teachings concerning the breaking down of the middle wall of partition that had so long been maintained between the Jewish and the Gentile world would naturally subject them to the charge of heresy and their credentials as ministers of the gospel would be questioned by many zealous believing Jews. God foresaw the difficulties that his servants would be called upon to meet and in order that their work should be above challenge, he caused them to be invested with unquestionable authority from the, his established church. Their ordination was a public recognition of their divine appointment to bear to the Gentiles the glad tidings of this gospel. Brothers and sisters, the relationship between the Gentiles and the non-Gentiles is a subject of the gospel. It's a subject of prophecy. Well, we're gonna, the title of this presentation is God's Denominated People. There is only two denominated people in sacred history. If you have an Ellen White CD-ROM and you go type in denominated people, you're going to see that ancient Israel became God's denominated people at Mount Sinai when they were married to God, when they received his law and entered into a covenant with him. If you don't think they were married to the Lord at Mount Sinai, you have to explain how they were divorced of God at the stoning of Stephen. There was a marriage that took place. The, the Christian church from the stoning of Stephen until 1844, Sister White never one time calls the Christian church the denominated people of God, never once. The denominated people of God is raised up on October 22nd, 1844, when once again he marries the people. By the way, brothers and sisters, what parable is fulfilled leading up to October 22nd, 1844? according to Sister White, the parable of the ten virgins. And what was that about? It's a call to the marriage. It took place on October 22nd, 1844, where the Lord once again gave his people his name, married them, his law, and entered into a covenant. It's a repeat. The denominated people are a very special people separate from the Gentile world. Notice on the bottom of the page 160. This is an important quote. And then you ask yourself, I'll ask you as soon as we read this. I'm going to ask you a question. Everything should be carefully written that light should shine forth as a lamp that burneth. Much more should be written upon actual experiences and much more given in short articles right to the point on Bible present truth. The reasons why we are the denominated people of God are to be repeated and repeated. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. Here's a question. I always ask this question with this quote. The reason why we are the denominated people of God are to be repeated and repeated. The Sister White's emphasizing it, not me, right? So how many times 
in the last year or so have you heard a sermon on, at the worship hour explaining the reasons why we are God's denominated people? That is always the answer. I mean, it's zero, not a never. But she says they're to be repeated and repeated. We're supposed to understand what it means that we are God's denominated people, but silence is all we have on that subject. So maybe you're thinking, you know, what does this have to do with anything? But brothers and sisters, according to inspiration, we need to come to grips with what it means to be God's denominated people. Next page. We are to invite everyone, the high and the low, the rich and the poor, all sects and classes to share the benefits of our medical institutions. We receive into our institutions people of all denominations, but as for ourselves, we are strictly denominational. We are sacredly denominated by God and under his theocracy, but we are not unwisely to press upon anyone the peculiar points of our faith. In order that men might not forget the true God, Jehovah gave them a memorial of his love and power of the Sabbath. He says, Verily my Sabbath she shall keep, for it shall be a sign between me and you. Concerning Israel, the Lord declared, The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. To us, as well as ancient Israel, these words apply. God's people are to stand alone. The observance of the seventh-day Sabbath is to be a sign between them and God, showing that they are a peculiar people separate from the world in habit and practice. Through them, now notice this, this is the punchline, brothers and sisters, through this denominated people, through you and I, through them, God will work together from all nationalities a people for himself. That's what we've been called to do. That's the work of the 144,000, and everyone in this room has been called to strive to be among the 144,000 for the purpose of gathering people from every nationality unto himself. And the only way that we can do that is if we are a separate and distinct people under God's theocracy. That's what inspiration teaches. That's part of the, part of the reason that we need to understand what it means to be denominated. Notice this next quote, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 559. Seventh-day Adventists are now to stand for separate and distinct, a people denominated by the Lord as his own. Until they do this, until we stand alone, he cannot be glorified in them. Brothers and sisters, the Lord can't be glorified us, in us while we're holding, and walk, holding hands with and walking with the denominations of Babylon. That's what he says. That's what he says. Can't happen. Maybe you don't think it is happening, but I'm just saying it, the, the technical application is, is the Lord is not glorified in his people until they are a separate and distinct people. By the way, brothers and sisters, we're not. We're not. But God is going to make sure that we are in the very near future. You know how he makes his, his people separate and peculiar? At the Sunday law, that's, the test will arrive that will demonstrate whether you and I prepare a character for the seal of God or the mark of the beast, and suddenly the church is going to be purified and God's church is going to be separate and peculiar, but it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be that way. Um, we've already read the next quote, repeated and repeated. Notice what 1 Kings 14, 21 says. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. In Bible prophecy, there is a, a theme that runs throughout the prophets that the Lord chose Jerusalem to put his name in Jerusalem, and Bible prophecy teaches that he chooses Jerusalem again. When does he choose Jerusalem again? 1844. 1844, he chose Jerusalem again to raise up a denominated people because the word denominated means to be named. He's going to put his name in Jerusalem once again in 1844. You see the definition there. Notice Zechariah 1. Bottom of the page. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. This is a theme of the Bible prophets, that at some point in, in the future of their day and age, the Lord for a second time was going to choose, choose Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem he chose was not literal Jerusalem. It was spiritual Jerusalem. Uh, next page. Denominated means named. On Sunday, I had freedom in showing our colors on which were inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I told them that we are Seventh-day Adventists, and the reason of the name which 
the, which distinguishes us, uh, us from other denominations. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Are we ashamed of our name? We answer, no, no, we are not. Do we answer that in Adventism? Is that how we answer today? I wonder. It is the name the Lord has given us. It points out the truth that is to be the test of the churches. Fundamentals to Christian of Christian Education, page 506. Thus the children of Israel were denominated as a special people. By a most solemn covenant, they were pledged to be true to God. Then the people were bidden to prepare themselves to hear the law. On the morning of the third day, the voice of God was heard speaking out of the thick darkness that enshrouded him as he stood upon the mount surrounded by a retinue of angels. The Lord made known his law. And this experience happened in Adventism on October 22, 1844, paralleling that experience that happened with ancient Israel. Ancient Israel is prefiguring modern Israel. And what happened to ancient Israel? They went 40 years wandering in the wilderness because of their disobedience. Brothers and sisters, it's time to get out of the wilderness and go into the promised land. That's what Bible prophecy is teaching. The Lord is about to finish his work in righteousness, and all that want to participate in that work, all they have to do is meet the conditions of the gospel. That's it. He's calling. He's willing to finish the work he's begun in us. Notice in Acts of the Apostles, page 145. Meanwhile, worshipers from every nation sought the temple which had been dedicated to the worship of God, glittering with gold and precious stones. It was a vision of beauty and grandeur, but Jehovah was no longer to be found in that palace of loveliness. Israel as a nation had to force herself from God. To be denominated not only means to be named, it means to be married. We are married to the Lord. Notice what, as God's denominated people, what the burden of what we are to be doing is. Councils to Writers and Editors, page 109. In these last days, the one who was once an exalted angel in the heavenly courts is to take the philosophy of men under his training. The people of God are to guard carefully against the seductive influence of the deceiver. They are to hold firmly the new theology that has come into Adventism at the end of the world. Is that what it says? It says they are to hold firmly to the truths which called them out of the world and led, them to, to, and led them to stand as God's denominated people. Next quote, God is a denominated people who are to wait on and trust in him. They are to be true to the light he has given them, following closely the sacred landmarks. What are the sacred landmarks, brothers and sisters? First, second, and third angel's message. They're to hold firmly this history. And this chart is representative of the truth of this history. This is what God's denominated people are supposed to hold on to. Why? Because Satan is going to make it an attempt to tear down these foundations. That's what she just read, said. Uh, I am instructed, to, next page, I'm instructed to say to those who endeavor to tear down the foundation that has made us Seventh-day Adventists, we are God's commandment-keeping people. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to becloud our minds regarding the teachings of the Word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And the message of heaven for these last days is given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth, point by point, has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle work working power of the Lord, but the way marks, brothers and sisters, the way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved, and they will be preserved, as God is signified through his word and the testimonies of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. God has placed in our hands the banner in which is described the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, he declares. At all times and in all places, we are to hold the banner firmly aloft. God's denominated people are to take a firm stand under the banner of truth. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're almost done, by the way. Go to page 164. <clears throat> I want to put one more, one more thought in place for the next presentation, an important understanding. Oh, how little finite beings comprehend the deep things of the Lord God. How few comprehend or try to ascertain the mysteries of the rejection of the Jews and the calling of the Gentiles. Have you ever thought about the, the rejection of the Jews and the calling of the Gentiles? What does that mean? We're supposed to. 
The Bible presents beautiful truths that all may understand, and at the same time, it deals with deep mysteries and doctrines which will require deep thought to understand. But nothing is to be misinterpreted, misapplied, or weakened as lightly inspired, if inspired of all. at all. God does nothing by halves. His word is inspired, and God designs that men shall take the scripture as his inspired word, and any man that shall venture to, to distinguish between the portion of God's word exalting one and belittling another and taking away from another places himself in dangerous positions. So I'm going to try to show something here with, for you now at this point. In your notes, you have the series of articles that Hiram Edson wrote. Hiram Edson concludes that the time of the Gentiles ended in 1798, but Hiram Edson was also trying to prove that William Miller was wrong about this 2520. I suggest to you that they were both right. I also suggest to you that the time of the end, Gentiles ends in 1844, and Hiram Edson wasn't seeing it. And I want to share with you why I believe that. And we're, all, and we're almost finished. Divorce begins the time of the Gentiles. The time had come for an entirely new phase of work to be entered on, upon by the Church of Christ. The door that many Jews, Jewish converts had closed against the Gentiles was now to be thrown open. And the Gentiles who accepted the gospel were to be regarded as on an equality with the Jewish disciples without the necessity of observing the rite of circumcision. After the stoning of Stephen, there's no distinction. Okay, Gentiles equal with those of the circumcision. Now notice two more quotes to go through. Desire of Ages, 233. The one week, seven years, ended in AD 34. What's this one week? This is one of the components of the 2300-year prophecy, right? The one week, seven weeks, ended in AD 34. Then by the stoning of Stephen, the Jews finally sealed their rejection of the gospel. The disciples who were scattered by persecution went everywhere preaching the word. And shortly after, Saul the persecutor was converted and became the apostle to the Gentiles. Now notice what she says here. The time of Christ's coming, his anointing by the Holy Spirit, his death, and the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles were definitely pointed out. What is she talking about here? She's talking about Daniel 9 giving the breakdown of the 2300 days. She's talking about the 2300 year prophecy, and she's saying when you take the different components of the 2300 year prophecy, which every one of us in this room should understand as Seventh day Adventists, she says each of them were definitely pointed out, and therefore the time of Christ's coming, then when was the time of Christ's coming in, in that prophecy? Yeah, when he was anointed. And he was anointed. That's definitely pointed out in the prophecy. His death, when was that pointed out? The midst of the week. He'd be cut off. The giving of the gospel to the Gentiles, AD 34, specifically pointed out. All right? Now, no, now drop down to the next quote. Great Controversy 410. The 70 weeks, or the 490 years, were to pertain especially to the Jews. At the expiration of this period, period, the nation sealed its rejection of Christ by the persecution of his disciples, and the apostles turned to the Gentiles. AD 34, the first 490 years of the 2300 having then ended, 1810 would remain. She's made a specific distinction. The first part of the 2300 years, the 490 years, is for Israel, and the 1810 is for who? The Gentiles. And it's been specifically pointed out. From AD 34, 800, 1810 years extended to 1844. Then, said the angel, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Brothers and sisters, the time of the Gentiles, according to inspiration, ends in 1844. Now, if you're not aware of it, there's a lot of weird teachings about the time of the Gentiles in Adventism. We teach here sometimes that it ended in 1967 in the, the Seven-Day War, was it? Five-Day War? Something like that when the Jews reclaimed Jerusalem. The time of the Gentiles ended October 22nd, 1844, where God married a people once again, the second denominated people in history. And God specifically points to this time when it was going to take place, not only with the 2300 year prophecy of Daniel 8:14, but with the 2520 year prophecy of Leviticus 26, which is repeated and confirmed in Daniel 4 and Daniel 5. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as your people here at the end of the world, we understand that we must be separate and distinct 
from the men and women that aren't part of your church in order to glorify you and bring them unto you. Help each of us in our individual experience to take this lesson individually and bring our lives into agreement with this. Help us to be fit representatives of your peculiar people, uh, the people that have been called to the privilege of representing your character perfectly at this point in time. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name.